Good evening, everyone. This sure is good to have everyone here. We are so thankful for your presence. It's been a, a very nice fall afternoon. Good weather, the leaves are falling and it's starting to be pretty. Only bad thing about tonight is that Suzanne brought Jerry with us. Other than that, everything's just great. It's good to have our visitors. We're very thankful for everyone that is here, especially our visitors. We hope we'll come back every chance we can. It's always a blessing to be able to hear, like I said, the preacher David speak, and we're thankful for his continued efforts. I don't have any updates on the prayer list. Uh, be sure and keep Diane Deering in your prayers. She's having surgery this week. And also uh, Fanny and, the, and her twins and Jessica, if they're still out in Texas. Get that uh, Fanny's address has been updated, and that's on the bulletin board in the back. So make sure you check that out. Our young men are going to lead our worship tonight, so we're thankful for that. Uh, if you pay attention, they help all through the month, not just this one Sunday a month. So we're very thankful for their uh, dedication to serving our Lord as well. Don't forget, Group One will be signing compassion cards tonight. Uh, group Two set the, set the goal pretty high last week, so it looks like we have to have about a hundred. Attendance just for y'all to match what they what they had uh, last time. So do the best you can. <clears throat> Door knocking for this month will be on November 9th. That's always the second Saturday, so you can keep that in your calendar. Be here at the building at 10 a.m. We'll go out and knock doors for the new movers into our area. Team singing is November 10th. That will be at Sublinga Road uh, Church at 2:30 p.m. Plan on that if you are want to go to the team singing. Group 2 will sign compassion cards on the third Sunday. That'll be November 17th after evening worship. We are collecting bags of candy for the Christmas parade. There are cubs in the foyer and in the hall. You'll be able to place those there. You can also uh, place items for our gift boxes as well in those same baskets. Right now they're collecting uh, bottles of lotion, small boxes of raisins, small candy canes, and there'll be other perishable items added to that list later. Our holiday gift exchange and meal will be on Sunday, December 8th, following morning worship, so keep that on your calendar. You can bring, if you want to participate, bring a $10 gift and label that for men, women, or children, depending on what type of gift you bring. That's all the announcements I have at this time. And since young men are leading our worship, I will turn the worship service over to them. There's a call come ring all the restless waves in the light, in the light, in the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, in the light, 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 in the
Good evening, church family. It's so great to be here with you tonight. I couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks at the Lafayette Church of Christ. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. That's where we are going to pick up our study tonight. And remember, if you will, that according to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 23, the book of Hebrews is book of encouragement. And we have been picking the words of encouragement from each chapter. So what's our words of encouragement for this chapter? Look at verses 19 through 22 with me. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, Notice, if you will, that in these verses that the writer is talking about the blessings we get to enjoy because of the body and blood of Jesus and the first blessing that he refers to us, that we have boldness to enter the holiest. The word have is a present tense verb which indicates that this was something that they currently had. And what did they have? They had boldness or confidence. Confidence to do what? They had confidence to enter the holiest. And the holiest is the presence of God. The second blessing that the writer refers to us. We have a new and living way. This is a reference to the new covenant, which is built upon better promises. And the word consecrated means to open. When Jesus died on the cross, the first covenant was taken away and the new covenant was established. The third blessing that the writer refers to us, Jesus became high priest over the house of God. And according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, the house of God is the church. 
And the fourth blessing that the writer references is that we have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, according to it, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses our conscience. Listen to what the Bible says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What about the phrase, our bodies washed with pure water? This is a reference to baptism, which is the only way we contact the blood of Christ. This can be seen in Acts chapter 22 and verse 17. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, as a result of these wonderful blessings, the writer said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Notice the word assurance. This word means conviction. So the writer is saying that these Christians needed to have a heart full of conviction. And that's going to be our word of encouragement in this chapter. Conviction. There are two paragraphs in this chapter. So here's how we're going to divide this chapter in verses 1 through 18. We're going to see that we can have conviction because of the superior sacrifice. And then in verses 23 through 39, we're going to see that we can have conviction because of a glorious promise. Let's begin with the superior sacrifice. And there are three things that we want to notice. Let's begin with the need for a superior sacrifice. And let's ask the question, why was there a need for a superior sacrifice? It was because of what the law couldn't offer. Now, why does the writer want them to know what the law couldn't do? Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verses 39 and 40. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. What did Jesus mean in these verses? Judaism taught that salvation or eternal life was a result of keeping the law, and Jesus wanted them to know that the salvation came through Jesus. It's just like many believe today that the Bible saves. Listen, the Bible doesn't save. But it informs me about a man who came to save me. And if I am obedient, then eternal life can be mine. That's why the writer began by stating that the law was a shadow of good things to come. Think about about a shadow for a moment. A shadow is not a reality. It only lets you know that something is coming. And as the writer said, the law was a shadow of good things to come. And the good things is a reference to Jesus and the new covenant. So what was it that the law couldn't offer? To begin with, it couldn't offer perfection. Look at verse 1. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Notice the word perfect. It means to make one complete spiritually, and the writer plainly states that those sacrifices which were offered year after year, couldn't make those who approach perfect. And this is not the first time that we've heard this. Look back to Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 18 and 19. And the writer said, For the law made nothing perfect. Someone may say, What about Noah? Listen to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. 
according to this verse, Noah was perfect. But keep in mind that Noah was said to be perfect before the law was given. So if the law didn't make Noah perfect, what did? Look at what the Bible said. Noah walked with God. And to walk with God is to live a life of humble submission to God's will. And Noah is not the only one to be spoken of as being perfect. The Bible teaches that David was perfect. Listen to 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 4. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Now this was after the law had been given, and if the law didn't make David perfect, what did? It was his life of humble, submissive obedience to God's will. Listen to what David said in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 32. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. To did David attribute his perfection to? He gave God the credit, not the law. A second thing that the law couldn't do is, it couldn't purify. Look at verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. The word purified means to make clean or to cleanse. And the cleansing is talking about a cleansing from sin, to free from the defilement of sin. But this word not only refers to the cleansing from sin itself, but also the guilt of sin. Can you just imagine this for a moment? When we are guilty of sin, it's not only the knowledge of sin that we bear, it's also the guilt that comes with it. And brethren, you know as well as I do, the guilt of sin is sometimes beyond our ability to bear. And the bad thing about the lies, it couldn't take away the knowledge and guilt of sin. And the third thing that the law couldn't do is, it couldn't remit sin. Look at verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. The word remission comes from the Greek word aphasis. This word is found 17 times in the New Testament. It refers to the dismissal or release from sin. It also refers to forgiveness. In fact, of the 17 times this word is found in the New Testament, 15 times it's translated forgiveness. Now, the word remission is not in this verse, but the idea and implication is there. Look at the phrase take away. It means to remove by cutting off. And look at the word reminder. This word means to remember. But it also refers to a memorial. For example, look at Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Notice the word remembrance. This is the same word as found in our text. And if you will notice, as Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, he uses this word in the sense of a memorial. And on every Lord's Day, we take time to remember the death of Jesus on the cross. With that thought in mind, under the law, there wasn't remission of sins. There was a reminder of sins. Each year there was a day of atonement when sacrifices would be offered for the sins of the people. This can be seen in Leviticus chapter 16 and verses 29 through 34. And those sacrifices didn't remit the sins of the people. They served as a reminder that they were guilty of sin. Now brethren, 
How would you like to live under a covenant like that? I've heard people say, Man, I would love to have lived in Bible times. And brethren, I'll take Christianity under the new covenant any day. But notice in the second place, consider the prophecy of the superior sacrifice. Verses 5 through 9 is a quotation of Psalm chapter 40 and verses 6 through 8. And the first you need to know about this passage is that it is a messianic psalm. And in this psalm, you have a conversation between the Father and the Son. This can be seen in the writer's use of the words I and me, and you and your. The second thing that you need to see is that writer quotes the psalm in verses 5 through 7, and then he repeats the psalm in verses 8 and 9 with very little variation. Why does he do this? He does this to emphasize the point he is making. And so what was the message that the Father wanted us to know? The main point of these verses is that it was not God's plan to perfect, to purify or remit the sins by the old law or the first covenant. Notice that the writer said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. And in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. According to verse 8, these were sacrifices which are offered according to the law. God's plan from the beginning was that the Son would inhabit a fleshy body. This can be seen in the phrase, but a body you have prepared for me. This is a reference to the incarnation of Christ. In John chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, the Bible teaches that the Word was God. Read it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now if you will drop down to verse 14, we'll see that the Word, which was Christ, became flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in that fleshly body, the Son would live a life of obedience. This can be seen in verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. This can also be seen in the word body. In the book of Psalm, the word body is translated ear, and the word ear represented obedience of the body, and that obedience involved the death of Jesus on the cross, which brought the first covenant to an end and established a new covenant. This can be seen in verse 9, when the writer says, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. A third thing that makes the sacrifice of Jesus superior is its sufficiency. The law was insufficient. And though there were many things that the law couldn't do, remember that from our text, we noticed three things that it couldn't do. It couldn't give them perfection. It couldn't purify them and it couldn't give them remission of sins. Now notice with me that what the law couldn't do, the sacrifice of Jesus made possible. Notice that where the law couldn't purify them, the sacrifice of Jesus brought about purification. Look at verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Notice that the writer said that we are sanctified, and our means of sanctification was the offering of the body of Jesus. But what does the word sanctified mean? The word sanctified means to make holy, or to separate from things profane and dedicate to the service of God. And it also means to cleanse or purify. And this is a perfect tense verb which represents something that occurred in the past with continuing effects in the present. Now, this is not the first time we've seen this word, is it? 
we saw it the first time back in chapter 2 and verse 11. And then it's found three times in this chapter. We have it here in verse 10, and then in verse 14, and then in verse 29. And finally, it's found in chapter 13 and verse 12. Why does the writer keep emphasizing the subject of sanctification? He wants them to understand that they have been separated from sin, that they had been dedicated to the service of God, that they had been purified, and that was made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus, and for them to go back to Judaism, they would be leaving the service of God and they would be leaving the state of purity and going back to sin. In the second place, whereas the law could not make them perfect, the sacrifice of Jesus made perfection possible. This can be seen in verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now remember that the word perfect means to be spiritually complete. And don't forget that the law could never make them perfect. It made no difference how many sacrifices they offered. Those sacrifices could not make them perfect. When those sacrifices were offered on their behalf, they left being reminded that they were guilty of sin. Just try to put yourselves in their position. What if when we came together to worship, you left knowing you were guilty? Can you just think about that for a moment? Now, brethren, aren't you glad that we don't? Listen to Colossians chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Ten and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Brethren, we are complete in Christ, and aren't you glad? The sacrifice of Jesus makes remission of sins possible. Look at verses 17 and 18. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 18 now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Notice the word remission. Its meaning is found in verse 17. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's the definition to forgiveness, isn't it? Remission is the forgiveness of sins. And the sacrifice of Jesus makes remission of sins possible. The apostle Peter told the people on the day of Pentecost, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, just as remission of sins was available for the people on Pentecost, it's available for us today. Do you see what the writer is doing? He wants them to know that the law could not give them perfection, purification, or remission of sins. Those things were made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus, so their faith had to be in Christ. You know, brethren, the same is true today. Perfection, purity, and remission of sins is only through Jesus, and so our focus must be on Jesus. And that brings us to the second part of the chapter that we want to look at, which is a glorious promise, and this can be seen in verses 23 through 39. Look at verse 23 with me. The writer said, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The word hold fast means to have a firm grasp on something to have in full and secure position. And that which we are to have a firm grip on is the confession of our hope. The word hope in this passage refers to a confident expectation. Brethren, what is our hope? Is it not to have a home in heaven someday? Certainly it is. 
and the phrase without wavering means in a steady fashion. So the writer is encouraging them to have a firm grip on their home in heaven, and then look at the motivation. For he who promised is faithful. What does the writer want us to know from this statement? When you think about heaven, it is a promise from God. And what do we know about the promises of God? When God makes a promise, he keeps it. Listen to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And why does God keep his promises? Look at what our text says. He is faithful. Brethren, that is a teaching throughout the Bible. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Listen to Lamentations chapter 3 and verses 22. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And brethren, what should be our response to the faithfulness of God? Listen to Psalm chapter 40 and verse 10. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Notice how David responded the faithfulness of God. I have declared your faithfulness. The word declared means to speak of or to command. Now the only way that you can be effective in giving a command to others is if you are practicing what you preach. So our response to the faithfulness of God the less faithfulness on our part. And notice that our faithfulness involves three things. And those three things are encouragement, expectation, and endurance. But before we discuss these three areas, we need to understand that faithfulness is not just about you and me. Faithfulness is about keeping one another faithful. This can be seen in the phrases one another and let us. Both of these are reciprocal terms which means that these things are to be done to each other. Brethren, faithfulness is about you and I doing everything within our power to make sure that we all are saved. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Notice the phrase each other. This is the same identical word in our text. And look at what the writer said that we are to do for one another. He said we are to comfort each other. The word comfort means to call to one's side and encourage or strengthen. Look at the word edify. It means to strengthen, to develop another person's life through acts and words of love and encouragement. And both of these words are present active tense imperatives. An imperative is the same as a command in the English language. So this is not an option. It's something that we must do if we desire to please God. So, with those thoughts in mind, let's begin with encouragement, which can be seen in verses 24 through 26. In verse 24, the writer says, And let us consider one another. The word consider means to fix one's attention on something in a very intense manner. Literally, it means to think down on something. Think about a microscope. When you place a slide under the microscope, and you can look deeply at the specimen you are examining. Now, notice what we are to consider. We are to consider ways we can stir up. The phrase stir up 
means to encourage or to strongly urge. So the writer is saying we need to look deeply into ways we can encourage. And the writer names two areas of encouragement. The first area is love. Jesus taught that love is the characteristic that would cause people to know that we are disciples. Listen to John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Why did Jesus lift love above every other characteristic? It's because love is the greatest characteristic that man can have. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. According to this passage, love is the most powerful characteristic that we can have. Such is why we are taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 16. Let all that you do be done with love. Such is why the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. But above all these things put on love. Why should we put on love? The Bible says that love is the bond of perfection. In other words, love is the glue that holds us together. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible says, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Notice the word fervent. It means deep or intense. So we are to have deep, intense love for one another. Now, the second area of encouragement is good works. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible teaches that we were created for good works, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible teaches, teaches that we are to be zealous for good works. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And the word zealous means to be deeply committed. And then finally, the Bible teaches that we are to maintain good works. Listen to Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to man. Notice the word maintain. This is a present tense verb, which refers to a continual ongoing action. Let me ask you a question. Why does the writer focus our attention on just these two areas of encouragement? Brethren, these two areas of encouragement are the foundation of faithfulness. Think about good works. And then look at John chapter 14 and verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Brethren, when we have love. We will keep the commandments of God, and we will be faithful. Now, after referring to love and good works, the writer specifically names a work that some were neglecting, and it was keeping them from being faithful. And what was that good work? Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, as is the manner of some, the word forsaking means to abandon. This is a present tense verb which means that this was an ongoing action. The word assembly refers to the act of being gathered together or assembled and assembling together. Brethren, this is talking about worship services. Now look at the phrase as the manner of some is. This refers to a habit. 
so some of them had fallen into the habit of not worshiping with the saints and it resulted in their unfaithfulness and brethren when we distance ourselves from worship then unfaithfulness is guaranteed and what was the solution to this problem it was exhortation look at what the writer said exhorting one another this word means to call to one side and encourage or strengthen now notice the phrase and so much the more as you see the day approaching what day does the writer have in mind he's talking about the second coming of christ that day will be the great day of judgment wherein man will give an account for the life he has lived listen to second corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad and when will this day be listen to second peter chapter 3 and verse 10 but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up according to peter this day will be as a thief in the night in other words we don't know when the lord is going to return now brethren what will be condition of unfaithful members on the day of judgment they will be lost now back to the phrase and so much the more as you see the day approaching since we don't know when the lord is returning and we know that they are in a condemned state we should put forth every effort to get them to come back as we continue to think about our faithfulness there is an expectation this can be seen in the end in verses 26 through 31 some of these christians had become unfaithful and as a result of their unfaithfulness there were certain things that they could expect to begin with they could expect guilt look at verse 26 for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins according to this verse these christians were guilty of willful sin and what does it mean to sin willfully the word sin is a present active verb which indicates a non-going unchanging action the word willfully means deliberately and then notice the phrase after we have received the knowledge of the truth brethren a willful sin is one that you keep on committing intentionally after the truth has been revealed to you and there is no desire to change this is persistent disobedience and notice what the writer said there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins listen to first john chapter 1 and verse 7 7 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin the words walking cleanses are present active tense verbs which means that as long as i walk in the light i have a continual cleansing of sins and what happens when i commit sin look at verse 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness notice the words forgive and cleanse these are aorist tense verbs they refer to an immediate unchanging action in other words when we commit sin and we confess that sin immediately in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we are forgiven but for those who are guilty of willful sins there is no sacrifice for sins in other words there would be no forgiveness of sins and when there is no forgiveness of sins there is guilt 
A second thing that can be expected if we are unfaithful is judgment. And notice what kind of judgment. Look at verse 27. The writer described it as a fearful expectation of judgment. And the word fearful means terrible or dreadful. And notice that the writer said they were deserving of this punishment. Why were they deserving of a dreadful punishment? The law demanded punishment for disobedience. This can be seen in 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. This is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verses 2 through 7. And notice if you will the severity of this punishment. The punishment was death. Now notice what the writer said in verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy? The writer is pointing out that if there was severe punishment for those who were disobedient under the first covenant, then the punishment under the new covenant would be much more severe. And the writer gives three reasons. Number one, they trample the Son of God underfoot. Can you just imagine for a tree Jesus like a doormat? Number two, they counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. Now think about this one for a moment. The word common means unholy or unclean, and whose blood was shed for the new covenant. It was the blood of Christ. Think about the word sanctified. It means to separate for the service of God. To be sanctified is to be made holy. That which makes us holy is the blood of Christ. Listen to it, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Can you imagine calling the blood of Christ unholy or unclean? And number three, they insulted the Spirit of grace. Brethren, it was the Holy Spirit who told them about the coming Christ. And notice the words trampled and counted and insulted. These are aorist tense verbs. And an aorist tense verb represents an overall and changing condition. Do we understand the severity of this sin? They kept on trampling the Son of God underfoot, and they kept on counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and they kept on isolating the Spirit of grace. Let's stop right here and make application. There are many right here at Lafayette who were here this morning and yet they are not here now and they won't be here on Wednesday night. They are just like these people that we are reading about. They have fallen into the habit of not assembling with the saints. And brethren, they are lost, just as these Christians we are reading about were. Brethren, we have a mission field of the lost right in our presence. They're in front of us, behind us, and to the side of us. And I'm reminding us of that so we can reach out to them before it's everlasting to late. A third thing that they could expect if they were unfaithful was the vengeance of, of God. This can be seen in verses 30 and 31. And the word vengeance refers to just punishment. And what is the vengeance of God for being unfaithful? It's eternal destruction. Listen to Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 through 9. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 
notice the two categories of individuals who will experience eternal destruction. The first group are those who do not know God. This refers to those who do not understand, those who do not know God in the sense that they have never obeyed the gospel of Christ. But notice those who do not obey the gospel. This is a present tense verb, which refers to an ongoing action. Brethren, obedience to the gospel doesn't end at baptism. It begins at baptism and continues throughout our lives. And this is a reference to individuals who stopped being faithful. And finally, faithfulness depends on endurance. This can be seen in verses 32 through 39. In verses 32 through 34, the writer reminded them of a time when their faith was being tried. This can be seen in verse 32 when the writer refers a great struggle with sufferings. And notice what was involved in these sufferings. They were made the spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations. The word reproaches refers to an insult intended to damage one's reputation. And the word tribulation refers to a great pressing pressure. And in verse 34, the Bible teaches that their goods were plundered. This means that their belongings were confiscated and sold. And don't miss the fact that the Bible says that they were made a spectacle. This word means a gazing stuff. In other words, everywhere they went, they received this treatment. Now, naturally, this treatment was a result of them being Christians, but notice that this treatment was as a result of them being a companions with the author of this book. And notice their attitude. They were joyful. Brethren, how in the world could they be joyful under such circumstances? They had endurance, and endurance is standing firmly regardless of the circumstances. Now, what motivated them to endure? Look at the last part of verse 34. Knowing that you have the better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. With those thoughts in mind, notice what the author said in verse 35. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. These brethren were in danger of losing their confidence. And what was their confidence? It was a home in heaven with God. And these brethren were about to lose this blessing. And the solution to this problem is found in verse 36. They needed endurance. And the motivation for endurance is the promise that God has made to the Christian. And that promise that God has made to the Christian is a home in heaven. Now, notice the confidence that the writer places on in these Christians. Look at verse 39. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. What did the writer mean in this verse? Notice in verse 38 that he says that they just live by faith. And then notice the word perdition. This word means destruction. The writer is saying that we are people who do not cast off our faith. We are a people who believe in the saving of the soul or being faithful to the end. What if we had that kind of confidence in one another? I know that you are going to be faithful because that's who you are. You are faithful because that's who you are. There may be those here tonight who need to respond to the invitation. If you're not a New Testament Christian, why not become a Christian tonight? If you will believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ as the 